The next type of object are meteoroids. They are solid, just like asteroids, but they are much smaller. Uh, they range in size from a tiny grain, like a speck of uh, sand, up to maybe one meter. So when a meteoroid, this chunk, enters the Earth's atmosphere, it experiences friction with the atmosphere. It's moving relative speed between a uh, meteoroid and the Earth is tremendous, uh, tens of thousands of kilometers per hour. And therefore, they experience substantial friction which heats them up and they start to burn. When they start burning, they produce what we call meteor or a shooting star. And here, here is one spectacular photograph of this burning meteoroid that is producing a meteor. Now, it turns out that we observe more meteors after midnight than before midnight. If a friend tells you, okay, let's watch for on a clear night sky, let's go and see if we can see some meteors, you should go out after midnight, not before midnight. And the reason is that after midnight, we are on the leading edge of the Earth. Here's the sun, sunlight coming from the sun towards the Earth. And this particular location uh, opposite to the sun is where it's midnight, right? And the Earth is spinning, right? So points here are already on the leading side of the Earth along its uh, orbit uh, around the sun, okay? So this side will scoop up more material because it's the leading side. It will scoop up the meteoroids in front of them uh, than the trailing side, okay? So after midnight, one is on the leading edge of the Earth, sort of in the, facing the direction in which it is moving and therefore it is more likely that one of these meteoroids will enter the atmosphere and start burning. Turns out that they start to burn at about 130 kilometers above the ground. And most of them, those small, small, really small ones, they don't have enough material there uh, to sustain them and uh, so that they can reach the surface of the Earth. So most of the meteoroids burn out by about 80 kilometers above the ground. Nevertheless, the number of these bodies that hit the atmosphere is quite large. So it is estimated that um, about 100 tons of material strikes the Earth's atmosphere every day. Uh, those uh, more massive meteoroids that don't burn out, uh, they will land on the ground. And once they are on the ground, we call them meteorites. So it goes from meteoroid before it starts burning to meteor when it burns, if it survives the trip through the atmosphere and falls on the ground, uh, it is called meteorite. Again, classification of meteorites uh, based on their uh, composition. The first and the largest group are so-called stones. Turns out that 95% of all meteorites uh, are in this group. And they're composed from silicate rock and they look just like a regular stone on the Earth. Here is a photograph of one stone, right? right? I mean, you, you, when you look at it, you wouldn't say that it wasn't Earth's rock. And that's why stones are very hard to point out say, at our latitudes, because we can distinguish them easily from regular stones. The best uh, location to find them is Antarctica, because there is a substantial and stable cover of ice. In the Arctic, the ice is not as stable. It melts. These rocks would sink. Then when the stuff refreezes, the rock is buried in the ice. And snow. That is not the case in Antarctica. The ice cover is much more stable. So if you see a rock like this, 
uh, on ice, well, I mean, the only way it could have gotten there is if it fell down from the sky. So the best so-called finds of meteorites are in Antarctica. The second group, but it's much uh, smaller, are so-called items. About 3% of all meteorites are uh, items. Uh, and they are made out of uh, nickel and iron, hence uh, the name. So here is a photo, uh, photograph of one uh, such meteorites. And here below, you can see a really huge iron with cavities where these two young boys can actually fit in. Okay, so you can gauge the size of this chunk. The third group, which is the smallest, are uh, stony irons. 1% uh, of all meteorites belong to this group. Here is a photograph of one stony iron where you have metallic particles mixed in with, together with the silicate rock. Right? Here are these shiny enclosures are metals. They are shiny because metals have high reflectivity. Right? And this intervening material is just silicate material. There are uh, also a few so-called carbonaceous or um, carbon-rich uh, meteorites. Uh, one of them was actually found here in Canada in 1969. It's called Murchison. And there is another one found in, uh, I believe, Mexico, Allende. Based on their composition, we have these three groups, stones, irons, and uh, stony irons. But another way to look at them is to classify them uh, based on uh, how they were formed, that is, based on their origin. And one group uh, are so-called primitive or not differentiated meteorites. They were formed in the very early history of the solar system. And uh, they have not been subjected to high temperatures or high pressures during their lifetime. Carbonaceous meteorites, like the Murchison that I've just showed, and some stones, not all, but some stones, belong to this group of primitive meteorites. Okay, so that's some of the earliest material in our solar system. Uh, the second group are so-called differentiated meteorites, and they result from uh, the pieces of asteroids or rocks from Mars or Moon that were knocked out when either M Mars or Moon was struck by a larger object, an asteroid, say. It would kick out debris, and some of the debris could have been flung towards the Earth, attracted by the Earth's gravity, and survive the trip through the atmosphere and land on the surface of the Earth. So to explain this uh, business of differentiation, we talked about that when we talked about the interior of the planets. Here is a schematic view of undifferentiated asteroids where we have a basically a rock matrix with the pockets of metals, iron and nickel. And then if there is also radioactive material trapped in there, it can generate enough heat to melt the interior. And then, of course, you know that the heavy metals will sink to the bottom, to the center, and the silicate rock would end up on the surface. So this is the transition from undifferentiated asteroid to the one that is differentiated. So then if such a differentiated asteroid is struck by another asteroid because there is, uh, although their average distance is one million kilometers, there are so many of them that uh, the collisions are likely. So if a differentiated asteroid was struck by another one, it could break up because of the impact. So you end up with the smaller pieces and some fragments are pure iron nickel 
and others are rock. It is possible to have meteorites that originate from Mars or Moon. Here is a photo of a Mars meteorite. And how do we know that it came from Mars? Well, uh, in 1975, there was a probe Viking sent to Mars, and it could uh, analyze the chemical composition of the rocks on Mars. And scientists found uh, great similarities. So the odds are that this indeed is a piece of a neighboring planet that ended up here. And in the same way, some of uh, meteorites uh, are chunks of moon that were kicked out by impact of a larger uh, object. That's not the only source of meteoroid. Many are debris scattered from comets. So what is the evidence for that? It is the connection between so-called meteor showers and the Earth crossing uh, the orbit of the comet. There are two best known, there are more, but these are the best known meteor showers. One is in the summer, so-called Perseid shower on August the 12th, and Leonid shower on November 17th. So here is a photo of how a typical meteor shower looks like. This is the photo of Perseid shower. And if you look at these tracks produced by burning meteoroids, it looks that they all come from the same spot in the night sky. And the names, Perseid and Leonid, uh, come from that fact. It turns out that that spot, the so-called radiant, in the case of Perseid shower, is in the direction of constellation Perseus, hence the name Perseid shower. And the radiant of a Leonid shower is in the direction of a constellation Leo. Okay, so that's where the names come from, where the radiant is located in the night sky. Okay, so here is the connection. Uh, we know the orbits of several comets quite well. And the comet, uh, when it gets close to the sun, uh, say closer than uh, the distance to Jupiter, it receives lots of solar heating and uh, the material from the comet, which is a mixture of ices and rocks, starts to evaporate, right? And basically what happens is that along its orbit, we have a large number of small meteoroids. So as it happens, Earth can cross it doesn't cross um, the orbit of every uh, comet, but in some cases, it does cross uh, the, uh, the orbit of the comet. And when that happens, of course, it, the Earth will strike more uh, meteorites. And as a result, they will be more frequent. We see these so-called uh, meteor showers. Okay, so <clears throat> these dates for different showers indeed coincide uh, with the dates when the Earth in its uh, revolution around the Sun crosses those orbits. So clearly that tells us that these particular meteoroids producing meteor showers uh, have to be related to the comets. They're not pieces of asteroids. So as I uh, said uh, earlier, uh, it looks as if during the shower, all meteors come from the same point in the night sky, so-called radiant. But that's an illusion. In fact, their trajectories are parallel. And because they come from the great distance, it looks to us as if they are coming from the same point in the sky. You can understand that through an analogy. Uh, say, like in this photograph here, you are on a very long road, and you know full well that the edges of the road are always at the same distance from each other down the road. They are two parallel lines. But when we view the long road, it looks to us that these two edges will meet 
at some distance from us. Although they are two parallel lines. Basically, that's why it appears to us that these meteorites come from the same point in the sky, but that's uh, just uh, a matter of our perception. Their trajectories are parallel to each other.